Well, welcome to today's screencast and today's The Teach Gym Show, the place to teach, to learn, to grow. We're going to be telling a few stories about how to use technology in teaching and how to teach with technology. The purpose of today's lesson, if you will, is to go through and understand the sequence of events and how they make a difference in a story. So we're going to start by reading from one of my favorite books. It's called Wayside School is Falling Down by Louis Setchar. And this is a book that is a very funny book, and it starts off rather funny. So um, you have to understand something about Wayside School. Wayside School is a very, 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 very tall school. That school is, uh, I think, 32 stories tall, and it has one classroom on every story. And so there's an entrance at the bottom of the, of the story, of the, um, excuse me, of the school, and there's a staircase that goes all the way up the 32 stories to the top floor of Wayside School. And Wayside School is falling down, um, has kind of an interesting little side note to it, and that is some interesting crazy things happen there. So I'm going to start off with the beginning of the book, Wayside School is Falling Down by Louis Setchar. So here we go. A package for Miss Jewel. Lewis, the yard teacher, frowned. The yard, the schoolyard was a mess. There were papers and pencils lying all over the playground. They were everywhere. How did all this junk get here? This is crazy. And so, and it wasn't his job to pick up the garbage, but he had said he, he knew that. But he just, you know, was supposed to pass out the balls during lunch and recess and make sure the kids didn't kill each other. He sighed, and then he began cleaning up. He loved it when he loved the children at Wayside School, and he didn't want them playing on a dirty playground. And as he was picking up the papers and pencils, a package showed up. Um, so he went over to the 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 truck that showed up, and he says, "Oh yeah, I can help you with that." And he helped to unload a package. Now the package was a big box; it was a really huge box. And he said, um, "I could take it up to Mrs. Jewell's class." It's from Mrs. Jules, right? And he said, yeah. It had the word fragile written on it, so he was very careful not to drop it. little sidelight here. The picture in the book shows the box with Lewis carrying it and the sign fragile, and with an arrow pointing up, pointing down. <laughs> shows up, and that's pointing down. So the package was too big. He could barely see around it. Fortunately, he knew his way to Mrs. Jules' class by heart. It was straight up. Wayside School is 30 stories high and only one room on each story. And Mrs. Jewell's class was the very top. It was Lewis's favorite class. And he pushed through the doors and he started up and he huffed and puffed and he walked up the stairs. Um, I'm going to take cut this a little short as you can tell. And he, um, he stepped easily from the 18th story to the, to the 20th. There was no 19th story. Mrs. Zaris taught the class on the 19th story. There was no Mrs. Zaris. And so you get the idea here. This is kind of fun. He stumbled up to the final step on the 30th floor. So he makes it finally all the way to the very top, and he's standing up here on the top of the 30th floor. With a big box in hand, and he knocks on the door. And Mrs. Jules was in the middle of teaching a class, and she was teaching her children about gravity. And she heard a knock. Come in, she said. Oh, I can't open the door, Lewis said. So Lewis is standing there at the side of the door, and you can imagine this, the door handle there, and he's got this big, huge box in his arms, and there's just no way for him to get in while holding the box. And so Mrs. Jules offers her, says to her kids, well, let's just take a chance here and see if we can help him out. So, um, oh, dear, how will I choose which children could open the door? And so all the kids then were sitting in their desk inside the classroom, and they looking up and saying, oh, my goodness, let's have a spelling bee. We could solve it that way. So they started down the spelling bee. Just a second, Mr. Jewell says, Allison, the first word is yours, heavy, heavy, says Allison, H-E-A-V-Y, heavy. Well, very good, Jason. Very good, Jason. You're next. Tired, tired, said Jason. S-L-E-E-P-Y, tired. Lewis felt the package getting heavier and heavier, was weighting down on him, and he shifted his weight, and his fingers were going numb. Actually, he didn't feel them go numb. <laughs> Jenny, package, package, said Jenny. B-O-X, package, excellent, said Mrs. Jules. Anyway, they continue on, and at the end, they get to the, 
end of the spelling bee, and the door opens up. And so it swings wide, and Lewis is able to go right in, and he says, where do you want me to put it? And Mrs. Chill says, well, where would we put I don't know. What is it? And Mr. Lewis says, um, it's, let's see, I don't know. Let's take a look. Oh, yeah. And he held the box of Mrs. Jewell, stood up on her chair next to him. So she's standing on top of this chair, looking into the box. And as she looks into the box, she sees, oh, it's a computer. It's a computer, explained Mrs. Jules. Everybody booed. Oh, what's the matter, said Lewis. I thought everybody loved computers. We don't want it, Lewis, said Eric Bacon. Take it back, said Jack. Take it back, Jack, said Terrence. Get that piece of junk out of here. Well, now, don't be, don't be that way, said Mrs. Jules. The computer will help us learn. It's a lot quicker than paper and pencil. But the quicker we learn, the more work we have to do, complained Todd. So Todd wasn't too happy about having to do that. So, well, let's get the computer. Let's go put it on the back counter. So Mr. Jules took the box and placed it by the back counter. And that box, he unloaded it and got it out there, and there it was. It was a big, nice computer big monitor on the top of it, and it also had a keyboard, and it had, um, let me see, what does it say here? And we gathered around the new computer. It was full, full color monitor, and it had two disk drives. You can tell the book's a little old. And then Mrs. Jewell, seeing the computer there on the counter, reached over, and here's what happened. She pushed it out the window. They all watched as it fall and smashed on the ground. It fell and it fell and it smashed, caused splatters on the ground. So I'm going back now and drawing the picture out of the 30th story. And here the computer is falling down, 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 and it splats. <laughs> Big, giant explosion down there where it splats. See, said Mrs. Jules, that's gravity. Oh, now I get it, said Joe. Thank you, Mrs. Lewis. Thank you, Lewis, said Mrs. Jules. I've been trying to teach the kids about gravity all morning. We've been pushing and using papers and pencils, and they didn't get it. But now with the computer, it was a lot quicker. <laughs> End of the first chapter. You get the idea here. And, of course, they, how the sequence there is interesting. I love the way this author painted the picture by putting the paper and pencils out on the playground first. Then you make the meaning as you get up to the classroom, and as Mr. Lewis goes into the classroom, you start to understand that the papers and pencils were what they were throwing out the window trying to learn about gravity, and that they were landing on the playground, which is where he had started. So you need to have all the pieces come together. So when they throw the computer out the window and it hits the ground, they learn so much faster with computer, with the computer, or in this case, maybe technology. So you get the idea, one of the best ways you can learn and teach is with technology, right? Well, there's the arguments about that that we won't go into today. But the idea that technology solves learning's problems may or may not be true. Notice in the story it was order, interest, that the computer did teach, and that's probably about the only way you could teach with the technology. I jokingly told my daughter when she told me that this was what she was going to be teaching, I said, well, that's, that's nuts because... You, the technology doesn't teach at all. It's what people do with the technology that makes the teaching happen, makes the learning take place. And so that's what we were doing. So kind of fun there, kind of a neat story. So I'm now just saving off that picture, and I'm going to go open up a new picture onto a new blank screen, so I've got that now. Now the next story is a, a sequence. It goes in order. It has a first scene and I'm drawing here a big square on the screen, and it goes to the next scene, which leads to the next scene, and goes to a series of boxes with some arrows, and now I'm kind of bringing those to where they're making some curves, and now we're starting to go back with the, the arrows pointing back to the left now compared to going to the right, and each scene seems to be taking us in a different direction, and yet at the end, we end up with something very similar we started with, and finally the last scene takes you back to the first scene. So it's a circular story. The story isn't a complete circle. It starts at one place and it ends in the same place, much like some of our lessons go. We start off with an introduction and then we go through the sequence of the lesson. And we step three, step four, step five, step six, and then we end up at the very end of the lesson 
going back to the conclusion. And the conclusion many times points us to the introduction which says, remember we were going to learn this today? Well, this is what we did learn and how we learned it. So the story can be tied together. This particular book we're going to be reading ties the story in, in a little bit more of an interesting way. And so uh, we're going to go ahead and go down that route. Now to show this story, we're going to go use a tool called Pi Pi Let's see, what's it called? Picasa. Picasa is a free graphics, or free image processing program from Google, and it allows you to make movies. And what we've done, we didn't want to go through the regular route of taking and building a PowerPoint presentation like most of the time. So what we did here is we took pictures from the book, and again, copyright issues might come into play if this is uh, being sold for profit, if it's you know, if it's fair use is out, it's outside of fair use if I've used too much of the book. So you have to be careful in some of these situations. But the point here is I took a bunch of pictures with my phone, uploaded them to the computer, threw them in a folder, and then I just opened the folder, highlighted the first picture to the last picture, and they became a movie now inside of Picasso. So I'm now going to be just showing this movie. And I'm going to just do it a screen at a time and read the story to you. And so you'll, you know, on the radio here, will be missing the story. But for those of you online, you can see that. And if you want to watch it, you can, there'll be a link to it on the, on, the web, on the cast here. So here it is. If you give a mouse a cookie, he's going to ask for a glass of milk. And when you give him a glass of milk, he'll probably ask for a straw. And when he's finished with the straw, he'll ask for a napkin. And then he'll want to go look in the mirror to make sure that he doesn't have a milk mustache. And when he looks into the mirror, he might notice that he needs a hair trim, so he'll probably ask for scissors. And when he's finished giving himself a trim, he'll want to room to sweep. And he'll start sweeping. He'll get all caught up in the sweeping, and pretty soon he'll be all over the house. And then he may even end up washing the floors as well. And then he'll probably want to take a nap. And you'll probably have to fix him a little box for him with a blanket and a pillow. And he'll crawl in and make himself all comfortable and puff the pillow a few times. And he'll probably ask you to read him a story. And so you'll sit down to read him one of your favorite books. And you'll ask to see the pictures. And when he looks at the pictures, he'll want to draw one of his own. So he'll want, ask for papers, pencil and paper and pencils, and he'll draw. And then he'll probably ask for a glass of milk. And chances are that when you ask him for a glass of milk, you want a cookie to go with it. And so what you didn't see on the radio show here is we went through all those slides. It was a very nice presentation just from the file sitting in a folder and the state in order because the pictures were taken in order of the book. They're numbered in order. I didn't have to do any putting it into the presentation at all. So pictures went nicely. was able to read the story. Pretty cool way to go. And you notice it was a circular story. Now, yeah, I cut off about a third, maybe even half the book, so I didn't go through all of it. But there's some other technologies that do the same thing. You're able to leverage them into a presentation. One of the more recent ones that I'm going to talk about here for just a second is a program called VIEW. It's titled V-E-U. And V-E-U is a program that actually comes from the university. It's free, open source, and it's a mind mapping software essentially. It has nodes which you can click on and delete or add, but it also has a unique characteristic. You can take each of the items in that um, and connect them up and make a presentation. I'm not going to build this presentation in the interest of time here, but I do want you to become aware of the fact that all I did to bring in all the nodes that if you're looking at the computer screen here, you can see them all. These nodes were all put in here very, very easily by just highlighting a folder, and then that folder added all the pictures from inside that folder as nodes in this mind map or on the screen. Now I can connect those up as a mind map, or I can connect them up as a presentation. So it didn't place them in any particular order. So I'm not excited by that. We could have to play with the software a little bit more there. But I'm going to go to what are called pathways. And once I 
go to Pathways, um, I have to excuse me. I have to add the links to make the pathways. So uh, I have to highlight an item, choose Pathways, and here we go. Add node to pathway. Once I've done that, now it's added to the pathways, and I have that pathway tool that shows up. And now I can say, okay, that's the first picture that I've got in my pathways. And let's go ahead and go to the second picture and make sure I can get it in place. And so we've got him standing by in front of the door. So let's go find that picture. Um, there it is. Yeah, so here he is in front of the door. So it's going to be the next picture in my pathway. So now I'm going to add that picture to the pathway. So now that picture is added. And what happened is I have now a little line that's dotted from the first picture to the second picture. And a little icon in the corner shows what the, the image would be for that particular slide, if you will. So now I've got to go find the one where he's standing in front of the refrigerator, of course, giving him a glass of milk. So that's the next page. So you start to see this is a little bit more work. I have to do a little upfront stuff here to kind of look and gaze and make sure I've got the right parts. OK, there it is. So this is the next one. I highlight it. And I click on Add to the Pathway. Now I've got three pictures in the pathway. So that said, let's go ahead and just look at the presentation now. The presentation mode here is very simple. I just go up to Pathways, and I click Launch the Presentation. So there's an untitled presentation here for now. And boom, I have the first picture show up. The first picture is there. Oh, it's working backwards because, oh, go figure. Yeah, I haven't done this for a while. So what's happened is, um, I had one highlighted. When I had it highlighted, that one showed up first. So you go to the first picture. Boom, there it is. It's showing the picture name in the corner, so I could rename that. Hit the arrow key, it moves to the next picture. And arrow key moves to the next picture. So a very quick and easy way to put together a presentation from just grabbing the files off of a folder and throwing them up. And then, of course, from there connecting the pathways, and the pictures would be in order. So two slick ways to make a presentation out of just grabbing pictures from a file folder, one with Picasa and the other one with View. So there you go. That's sequencing in a straight order. Now, the last book I wanted to share with you is going to be mostly heavy in text. I had some other ideas for sharing it here in the screencast. I'm going to go back to my Auto Sketch program. And this kind of story structure I love. In fact, I've had a couple of instances in my life where it's become real. And we're getting to the end of the show here, so I'll go quickly. I'm not going to read the whole story, but I probably may need to to keep some of you uh, just fully engaged. So again, I'm going to go down, save this picture, and uh, then go off and create a new image so I can go that way. So opening up my new image, there we have it. And done there. Very good. You have a new image. And this is called The Day Jimmy's Boa Ate the Wash. So it's kind of an interesting title. This is by Trinka Hicks Noble. And I love this book. It is fabulous. Great story. And so listen to the sequence on this and see if it gets your interest engaged more fully. And so the child's coming into the door, in the door, and getting asked by his mother, um, So, how was your field trip? And so I'm just writing field trip onto the onto the screen here. So how was the field trip? Question mark. Oh, boring kind of. Until the cow started crying. So you see now we have some heightened interest. We've got this cow out here just mooing and crying and screaming. And there's a picture of that. So the mom asks, a cow crying? Question. Yeah. You see a haystack fell over on her. A haystack fell over on the cow. Oh my goodness. A haystack doesn't just fall over. Well, it does if the farmer crashes into it with a tractor. <laughs> you see what's happening here, right? All of a sudden we got the farmer crashing into the into the haystack. Oh come on, a farmer wouldn't do that. Well he would if he was too busy yelling at the pigs to get off the school bus. You start to see what happens. What were the pigs doing on the school bus? Eating our lunches? Well, why were they eating your lunches? Because we threw corn at each other, and they didn't have anything else to eat. Well, that makes sense. But why were you throwing corn? Well, because we ran out of eggs. Out of eggs? Yeah. Our eggs were all gone. Well, 
Because the uh, the boa constrictor. A boa constrictor? Yeah, Jimmy's pet boa constrictor. What was Jimmy's pet boa constrictor doing on the farm? Oh, he brought it to meet all the farm animals. But the chickens didn't like him. You mean he got he got him. You mean you took him into the hen house? Yeah, and the chickens squawked and squawked and were flying all over. Go on, go on. What happened? So you see how the order of this changes things. It's all by questions. Little pieces of information reveal the next part of the story, which is the next thing, and so it's all backwards, you see. It's this reverse order. Let me go a little bit further here, a little more quickly. We'll finish up. So, well, what the, so he got mad. Got mad? Yeah, because Tommy threw it. Well, threw one at him. Well, he ducked and it hit Marianne in the face, and pretty soon we were having an egg fight. And that's right, and we ran out of eggs when we were throwing corn. And this farmer's wife was screaming. Why was she screaming? Well, because of the boa constrictor. <laughs> he was sort of helping her with the clothes. And so, well, what happened to the boa constrictor? Well, he left them at the zoo. But we got a pet pig instead. <laughs> so you see how the story ends. That reverse order raises questions right up front, right in the belly. So, in fact, I had one of these experiences once. It happened when I uh, came home from a baseball game, and my wife asked me, how's the game? I said, well, it's all right. She said, well, did you hit anything? Well, see, yeah, I hit a triple. It was really pretty interesting. Oh, a triple? Well, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Oh, now I think about it. It was kind of, and there were three other people on base, and so we scored three runs. Oh, wow. A triple and three runs, that's awesome. Oh, and that's right, I forgot to tell you, it was the ninth inning when I hit the triple. The ninth inning? That's amazing. So you hit the triple in the ninth inning. Oh, yeah. And we were down two to, you know, down by two points. You were down by two points and you made three points score. That means you won. Well, yeah. Well, how did that happen? Well, when they pitched the ball, I was had two strikes and three balls, and, oh, my goodness, it was a full count. And I hit the ball and I got a triple. Everybody scored. <laughs> you see how that backward story came about. And it literally happened that way. It hadn't been that big a deal. It was a fun game we were playing. It was just mostly for recreation. But there the order was, backwards of what I probably could have come in with. Wow, I hit a grand slam or I hit a base home run or triple home run. And he's won the game because you see how that curiosity in the sequence of that story builds. And so people start asking questions, and they say, well, what happened with that? Well, what happened with that? And pretty soon, if each of those questioning areas is interesting enough, the story lends itself to the next question. That, my friends, is master teaching at its best. If you can teach with technology or without technology, but in a sequence that makes the most interest to your users, to your learners, that's what you want to have happen. You want to have the technology help them in their learning. So we've gone about the circular story, how that started at the end and, and began, started and ended at the same place. We looked at the idea of this wayside school is falling down, and how the author there did the same kind of thing, started with the papers and pencils on the ground, shared an interesting story that was unusual, ending with the computer crashing, teaching the very lesson that was trying to be taught with papers and pencils. But teaching with technology is so much better because it goes so much faster. You see, the kids learn better when you use technology. And there, my friends, is today's first lesson on teaching with technology. It's kind of fun, huh? And so that's what we're going to be doing off and on over the next little while is teaching with technology. I hope that this has been useful for you. When next time you have a lesson to teach, next time you have a message to share, consider the order of the information. If you plant a seed early, that seed has the potential to grow. And if you plant it appropriately, you can make it into a full circle that goes all the way around. And when it goes all the way around, it ends where it began, just as today's radio show ends where it began with the story of using technology to improve your teaching and learning. And I hope that you'll do that. This is the Teach Jim Show. I'm sure glad that you came by today, and I hope you have a good time with the things that you've got going on in your life. Enjoy the learning. <laughs> We hope you enjoyed the Teach Gym Show, the place to teach, to learn, to grow.